Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the Academy of the Uh, this is actually our first hybrid event open to the public. Um, so we have a few attendees here on site. We have warm bodies in the room. Um, we have attendees inside the Zoom and also via Facebook Live. Today, May 18 is celebrated worldwide as the International Museum Day. In line with this, and also to celebrate the National Heritage Month here in the Philippines, we organized this talk on the topic of Philippine flora before and after the galleon trade in partnership with the Philippine Native Plant Conservation Society of the Philippines, Incorporated. This is an educational program specifically designed to complement our ongoing exhibition at the third floor galleries titled Muntadas, Exercises on Past and Present Memories. So those of you who are here today, uh, if you have not viewed the exhibition, we recommend that you see it later now after the talk. The AAG team worked with conceptual artist Anthony Muntadas for a two year period period that transpired during the height of the pandemic. Meetings and research were done mostly online, and the exhibit was first mounted in November 2021, its original open, opening date, and ran until March 2022. Because of its minimal visitors, we decided to remount the exhibition this year. We opened last March 25, and the exhibition will run until early August. One of the projects that Muntadas developed is titled Malasiebas, or weeds in English. It's composed of a set of ceramic plates made in Sevilla, the city that was the center of trade at the height of the galleon trade between the Philippines, Mexico, and Spain. Each plate features a plant species that, based on research by Spain in Spain, eventually became invasive to the Philippine ecology. Muntadas used this as a concept, as a metaphor for colonialism. It is in this context that we reached out to the PNP CSI to develop a public program. Among its founding members is visual artist Ronald Chaposa, who is now preoccupied as curator of the Ar uh, Pinto Museum Arboretum. Some years back, he introduced me to Anthony Arbias, another founding member, both of them uh, are here to um, give this very interesting talk. So to introduce our collaborators, uh, the Philippine Native Plants Conservation Society is the premier non-government organization in the Philippines advocating for conservation of native flora and their natural habitats. Um, its founding was led by the late botanist Leonard Ko, who, was also, who also served as its first president. Anthony Arbias is the current public relations officer and board of trustee of the organization. A co-founder of PNP CSI, he's a national trainer for ecotourism at the Department of Tourism. Anthony also works as a consultant and plant researcher for ecotourism resorts and property developers. He is a member of the Environment Committee head and head of uh, head. Sorry, he's a former Environment Committee head of the UP Mountaineer. And he's also a bird watcher and member of the Wild Bird Club of the Philippines. Ronald de Chacoso, um, I've known you for many decades now, uh, earned his bachelor's degree in fine arts, major in painting in UP in 1989. He's a visual artist and writer, uh, an awardee of the 13 Artists Award of the CCP. Uh, in year 2000, and as I said, curator of the Pinto Museum Arboretum of Philippine Native Flora. Um, shall I read this? As, uh, as an artist, his works transform biology and natural science to an aesthetic crafting of painting. He recently um, curated a group show that I, I believe revol revolves around this concept. He met Leonard Ko sometime in mid-2000 mid and became more involved in conservation of habitats and the Philippine native flora 
strayed away from the visual arts and opting for a lar larger canvas. He became active in the society he co-founded, um, and Leonard Co became a member, um, or rather a mentor, in much the same way as Roberto Chabet, um, the late uh, art artist, um, one of the main proponents of uh, conceptual art here in the country, who was um, Ronald's teacher in the arts. So without further ado, may we call on our two guest speakers, Ronald and Anthony. Si Anthony mo una, no? And take the... Uh, si Anthony mo una. Hello, good afternoon, and uh, mabuhay. So it's great, great to be here with you. So uh, this afternoon, we'll be discussing the uh, uh, Philippine flora. Uh, and uh, we hope uh, we'll, this will be a very engaging uh, discussion. So our lecture would be divided into two parts. Uh, first, I'm going to discuss about the the objective parts of the lecture, and then this would be followed by my friend and colleague, uh, Mr. Ronald Achacoso. So uh, let's begin with the uh, pre-Hispanic times. No? Uh, uh, okay, so long before uh, the Philippines, uh, there was a interesting uh, a quote here, the, the Christian missionaries found paradise when they first set foot on the Philippine archipelago. They described the Philippine forest extending from shores to mountain tops. So uh, me, as a very avid uh, plant person, native plant person, I would imagine the Philippines is like this. Uh, this is Palanan, the, la the, the last great forest uh, located in the Northern Sierra Madre National Park. So when they went here, the the uh, the Spaniards, maybe the the whole biophysical uh, looks of the Philippines was like this: it's from the mangrove area all the way up to the mountains. It was filled with, you know, vast forest. Okay, and uh, right now, to uh, if we're going to relate it with what's happening today, uh, there's this concept. It's called the Sea to Summit or the Rift to Reach. Uh, principle in conservation. So long before, it was already intact, but right now uh, there's a lot of things which we've uh, went through. So some of them are already gone, okay? So many of our, the original indigenous people here in the Philippines, they consider the forest as a sacred ground and uh, as a sacred place. So as you can see, much of the uh, indigenous people of the Philippines before, they relied so much about the forest. So they, uh, they got the, their food from the forest, they hunt, and then they also harvested what they, uh, what they can harvest only for a substantial uh, reasons. No? So it wasn't for commercial use, it's for uh, personal or for family use. So the word sustainable was already practiced by the first Filipinos. Okay? So if we're, we're going to look at the Philippines, we're right here, right now, we're part of ASEAN. As you can see here, uh, those with the uh, green colors, uh, the World Geographical Scheme for Recording Plant Distribution uh, lumped all of these countries together, uh, saying that uh, our neighbors, we have the same type of vegetation or uh, forest type or even native plants. So. If we're going to relate it on a bigger scale, for example, this one or the blue ones would have the same flora and fauna. The lighter blue ones would have the same. So at that time, if you're already into plants or animals or you're into science, if uh, uh, a blue one goes to a purple one, one would easily see that, hey, it's not from here. How come it's here? So it's, it's, it's like that, no? And uh, we are part of the thing called Malaysia or the Malay Ma uh, Malaysian Biogeographical Region, straddling the uh, uh, equator boundaries of the uh, Indo-Malayan and Australian realms. So we are part of this uh, whole circle. 
And uh, sigo, maybe this is the best time to discuss what the, a native species is, okay? So IUCN or the International Union for Conservation of Nature defines what a, a native species uh, or it, they also call it as indigenous, okay? It means a species, subspecies, or a lower taxon occurring within its natural range, past or present, and uh, the dispersal potential, okay? So within the range, it occupies naturally or could occupy without direct or indirect introduction or care by humans. But for me, the more simpler term in biogeography, a native species is indigenous. So the key word is indigenous given to a, a given region or ecosystem if its presence in that region is the result of only local natural evolution during history so uh if you would see here uh i use this plant uh anyone could uh identify this plant on the right anyone ah sir okay so that is nara it's the national tree of the Philippines, okay? So this Nara is native to the Philippines. It is, can also be categorized as indigenous to the Philippines, but this one is also native to other countries like, uh, like what I've shown you earlier, uh, where we belong to the biogeographic uh, area we belong to. It's also indigenous or native to Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, Thailand, and other neighbors, okay? So during the early migration, uh, exotic species were already here in the Philippines, uh, even the uh, even the Hispanic times. No, so uh, to, uh, right now we're going to define what uh, an exotic or an alien species is. So when you say alien species, it also means exotic species or non-native species. Okay, so. It means a species or subspecies lower taxon occurring outside of its natural range, past or present. Okay, so in biology, uh, exotic species refers to plant species or animal species that is non-native. Okay, so it is introduced into an area where it does not naturally occur. So, what are the you know, what are the examples of exotic species? Okay, for example, corn, sugar, etc. So for animals, there's a lot of exotic species uh, which are very common to us, like uh, janitor fish, tilapia, and uh, uh, and many more. No, the cane toads, which are also detrimental to our ecosystem. So as early as uh, the pre-Hispanic times, uh, sugar was already here in the Philippines. A sweet potato or camote is already here. It's not not from the Philippines, taro, okay, not from the Philippines, but already here. Uh, it was already used, but not, not so much, no? And uh, sweet, sweet potato, taro, etc. So we have, because we had contacts uh, from our neighbors coming from the north, China, Japan, and then Indonesia, etc. okay? Okay, so during the Spanish colonization, during the Manila uh, Acapulco galleon trade, it began in 1565 and remained active for two and a half centuries until 1815. So that long. Okay, so many things happened, and uh, the galleon trade was uh, considered to be a global exchange of material culture. So physical, so uh, aside from plates, aside from clothes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, uh, they were uh, transported from one continent to another. And the Philippines was uh, on the center of this. So how long does it take for a galleon to, to circumnavigate the globe? So usually it takes three to four months to sail across the Pacific Ocean to Acapulco. So in each year, there are only around two to, uh, through complete uh, uh, voyages. So, since we're talking about plants, uh, I'm also uh, imagining how they transported plants from Acapulco to, to Manila and vice versa. 
because uh, if you're going to have that long voyage, you won't be able to to uh, to carry or uh, transport live plants. No, it's quite impossible because uh, there's a lot of uh, factors to be considered. For example, the uh, fresh water, since they have very limited uh, water on on their boat, and then if you're going to use it for plants, you know. Uh, that would be uh, it would consume a lot of fresh water, and then the 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 plants, for example, if they are live plants, uh, it would be very difficult because the the voyage is a three to four months. You won't be able to let those uh, live plants survive that whole trip because they would be exposed to salt, and salt you know it easily kills uh, uh, plants which are not salt tolerant. So the most ideal. Uh, uh, way for them to transport is by carrying fruits or uh, seeds, okay? And then uh, they would just uh, put it on the cargo area and then later on they would either sell or trade it to uh, other, other places. So uh, this is where the exhibit comes in. Oh, it, it's called the malas hair, hair vest, okay? So malas means... Uh, bad and then herbes means weeds so bad actually bad weeds it's a part of a, a three uh, three aspect uh, exhibit so uh, we're just going to focus on the plant plant part so i quote that uh, it says here diverse plants travel from mexico to the philippines in Mal manila galleons they grew here having invasive effects which is why they are now called the malas herbias uh, it is composed of a set of nine plates featuring species transported from the Americas through the galleon trade. These were confirmed to have had detrimental effects to our local ecology, so Philippine ecology. Montadas describes these plates as a critical tableware. So uh, I hope you've already been to the exhibit. You can see here that uh, those are actually ceramic plates and those are highly breakable. So that you know connects that the word critical tableware because those uh, plants can actually ruin the ecology and it represents the invasive effects of colonialism okay so uh, we have already discussed what uh, an exotic species is so this is the second grade or the higher level of uh, discussion about the exotic species or alien species so alien species or alien invasive species means an alien species which becomes its established in natural or semi-natural ecosystems or habitat. And it's an agent of change and it threatens native biological diversity. So it has detrimental effect. Although some, actually right now, uh, there are so many uh, exotic species living in the Philippines, but not all of them are causing detrimental effects. No, that's the reality. But uh, some are, uh, in ecology, there, there's a term called IAS or invasive alien species. So among the introduced species, these are the ones which are causing detrimental effect. So what are the guiding principles if, uh, on modern times if uh, we're already facing the problems of invasiveness? No, So the first one is actually prevention. Since the data is already there, you might as well prevent it from coming in, okay? Especially aquatic plants, you know, uh, 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 those which are, you know, high, highly marked, which are uh, very invasive in nature, no? And then vulnerable ecosystems should be accorded the highest pri priority for action, especially for prevention initiatives. So what are these areas? Examples are protected areas, national parks, uh, MPAs, et cetera, et cetera. So we already know, and I already identified those areas. So uh, the best thing is not to let the invasive species enter those zones because, you know, uh, if they're already there, uh, there would be, surely there would be problems someday. In the third context of alien species, unless there is reasonable likelihood that an introduction will be harmless, it should be treated as likely to be harmful. So due diligence, okay? So 
Uh, here are the, ano, uh, the concepts and definitions of invasiveness according to uh, Richardson, etc. Et okay? So when you say introduction of a species, it means that the plant or its propagules has been transported by humans across major geographical barriers. For example, Japan to Philippines, Acapulco to Manila, uh, Russia to, let's say, United States. So they have crossed geographical barriers and man is the the uh, no, the he's the transporter no and when you say naturalization uh starts when abiotic and biotic barriers to survival are surmounted and when various barriers to the regular reproductions are overcome so it means that the invasive species or the alien species are already there but they are you know capable of uh overcoming the native species around that area. So next is the invasion. It requires the introduced plants produce offspring in an area distant from the site of introduction. So example, if the plant species was introduced in Manila and then there was no person or anyone who transported in, uh, let's say Laguna or in Rizal, but you can already see it there, that means there's already an invasion. No? So by itself, it, uh, it can already reproduce either by other agents like bats, wind, water, bats, etc. And then the worst case is uh, what they call the transformers. For example, uh, an area used to be a, a forest and then suddenly there's uh, you know, man-made changes. And then after so many years, that area is now uh, populated by an invasive species or an alien species. That's what they call the transformers, okay? So that's the worst kind of them. So among the nine uh, 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 plants exhibited there, the first one is the agave americana. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this because currently it's being used as a landscaping plant. and uh, uh, this one was introduced during the Spanish or the Galleon period, okay? So I think the main reason why they introduced this is because of aesthetics or ornamental use. But in the Americas, they use certain species of uh, agave as, uh, as for liquors, no? for alcohol. They turn it into tequila. And the uh, question is, uh, are they... Are they invasive? Currently invasive in the Philippines. Have you, have you anyone seen their invasiveness? Uh, in I think three of my uh, travels across the Philippines, I saw some of them growing naturally already in the Cordilleras. No, so imagine the Sagada area or the Banawe area. There's a lot of pine. It's actually uh, 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 the dominant species growing there are the. Uh, the, the Benguet pine, no? the natural pine of the Philippines. That it, but in between those uh, uh, pines are the agaves. So somehow it has already penetrated the Cordilleras. Another example is in uh, uh, in the Visayas, no? in the uh, limestone out, outcrops of uh, Marinduque. And uh, there's another one across Bohol, how they call it, province. Uh, Gimaras, yon. Uh, on the small islands and islets, probably it was first introduced as an ornamental plant, but somehow it uh, was able to penetrate the limestone cliffs, and right now it's already growing there. But aside from that, uh, I haven't seen any on uh, more manageable areas. And uh, this one is the Ageterina adenophora, or the Mexican devil. And the other one is the Castilla elastica. Uh, I'm not so familiar with this one, but this one, uh, I think uh, right now, especially in Mandanao, they're using the, the Hevea brasiliensis, no? but it's more for agroforestry to produce latex, no? but it's not this one. And then uh, Mexican fleabane, Virginia pepperweed, common wireweed, and then the lagwood. No? From time to time, we can see this in the natural areas, but uh, not so much. And uh, 
uh, as I would rate the nine, these are the top two which are worst. No, one is uh, in the Philippines, they can easily be called the Madre uh, Madre de Cacao. No, we call this the Madre de Cacao or Cacawati. No, so it was introduced for many reasons. One is for medicinal, and then for uh, for the industry, and then. Uh, Currently in the Philippines, it's used as a biological post for if you have a property, you want to secure your area, all you have to do is to cut branches of it and then stick it on the ground and then put barbed wires and then somehow you'll be able to secure your property. So they grow that easily. And then as they grow along, as they grow old, uh, it's still living. No, So the diameter would grow and then the, the root penetration would also you know, strengthen the the no the the plant or the tree from the ground. So this one has some uh, levels of uh, invasion already. The the madre de cacao or cacawati. Okay. So, but the worst among the nine is the lantana camera. It's simply called lantana here in the Philippines. So everywhere you go, uh, you would certainly see this the lantana. If you're a mountaineer or you love the outdoors. On the marginalized area where we call this the jump off point, you would easily see lantana, no? Before you see or reach the forest uh, or what you call the forest line, you would you'd be greeted by the lantanas everywhere, no? So in other areas, since this is already worst, having the, the worst effect, uh, sometimes it's very hard to manage. So what they do is just... Uh, uh, declared the area as uh, uh, a victim area. So what they do is just, you know, cut whatever they can cut and then burn it to the ground. So that uh, hoping that uh, they would, uh, they would, uh, you know, completely destroy the whole population. So that's the the worst uh, among the nine herbas uh, plants. Okay, but uh, beyond the nine malas herbas. Uh, Ronald and I talk about this, no, because we've observed that many of them were not included on the list. So I'm sure most of us are Filipinos and uh, already familiar with the outdoors. You would uh, be uh, very familiar that most of the centuries-old churches in the Philippines they have uh, uh, what you call acacia or rain tree growing on the side, no. So acacia or rain tree, sa Manesaman, was introduced from Mexico. And uh, surprisingly, they have already penetrated the, our forest. No, So only last, last or this month, uh, this month, uh, we were on the field in La Union. That area was supposed to be uh, not, uh, not easily accessible by, by people. But uh, since there's a, a, a very famous uh, a falls there, they created a uh, an access road for ecotourism. And then I was surprised that there's a lot of uh, uh, acacia or the Samanea salmon living there, no? But there's, there's no, uh, there no one living that in that area. But how come there are a lot of old, uh, centuries old Samanea salmon? And then Cromolina. And then this one is uh, called the Acapulco, this one with the yellow flowers. And uh, this one is Passiflora or the Passiflora vine. And then this one is called the uh, uh, Aroma. No? Aroma is like a, a tamarind, but with a, a lot of uh, thorns. No? You would uh, certainly see this on beach areas around the Philippines, and they have very devastating uh, effect. No? And uh, it's very hard to eradicate. So what the developers and you know managers would you know hire people to cut them and then burn them because if you wouldn't uh, do that they would just be get uh, keep on coming back and then they would have detrimental effect on the the people and other wildlife and of course ipil ipil uh, later on we'll be showing you a picture of ipil ipil dominating uh, one of the biological hotspots here in the Philippines. I think Ronald would be showing it to you. And then, of course, everyone knows this one. This is called the Diffenbachia. This is also from uh, Mexico and South America. And then 
for almost all of the freshwater areas in the Philippines, uh, you would certainly see this one. This is called the water hyacinth. No? So highly invasive in nature. And then Cadena de Amor, there was a time that you know EDSA was uh, ornamented with uh, Cadena de Amor, but it's not even uh, native to the Philippines. And then Widelia, but right now it's, it has a different scientific name. And then Makahiya or the touch me not plant. So these are the most common and it remains common until the next generation because, you know, management wise, we were slow to declare them as, you know, terrible weeds. No, we still have that sympathy. And then, uh, yes, there was, uh, there was a period in our time until now that, uh, these uh, plants or introduced plants have devastating effects on us. But there are also good uh, stages in the Spanish colonization, but because it was an opportunity for us to have uh, uh, an overview of what we have in the Philippines. No? So one of the major contribution of the Spaniards to botany was the contribution of uh, Father Blanco. So he was the one he initiated the Flora de Filipinas. So according to the New York Botanical Garden, Flora de Filipinas remains as a monument to Philippine botanical art and illustration and science. It's the first comprehensive flora of the Philippines, but also the first to be illustrated in color. So I think there were three, uh, three uh, editions already. And uh, the one they use in this uh, exhibit was... Uh, was uh, I think uh, utilized from the uh, Florida Filipinas book. Okay, but uh, another person who is uh, uh, quite remarkable uh, is uh, what's his name? The the uh, I forgot the name. <laughs> anyway, uh, he, he was assigned by the Royal uh, Botanic Gardens. The uh, Dequelar, that's his name, and uh, during his uh, 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 during his responsibility, there was only he was only assigned one responsibility to look for the Philippine plants, but more on the economic the plants which has economic use for the galleon trade. Okay? And then another one, but the, he went into the picture already on the tail end of the colonization. It's around 18th century. His name is Vidal. No, so Vidal. Uh, is uh is one also one of the ano uh because he was trained as a forester so was he was able to penetrate the the the, the jungles of the Philippines which at the time are quite impenetrable and he had the ano the opportunity to really have a good adventure here in the Philippines unlike Blanco who was you know you know the, the guys were just uh, sending him the the plants, hey, have you seen this? No, okay, let's uh, draw it and uh, let's describe it. But uh, the, the two guys were the field guys. So for us, they, are, they had the, the more, more exciting life as a botanist. So uh, like wh what I've told you, uh, there was a more, more or less 250 years of a Spanish rule. And uh, there was a crossover with the Americans, no? So Spanish American. So I quote the PCIJ or the Philippine Center for Investigative Journalism because they were able to the to have a special uh, feature. It's called the Philippine Forest. So let's start with uh, Spanish rule first. Uh, the Inspection General de Montes and the Forestry Service are established to determine the extent of forest resources and oversee their utilizations. Licenses are required to cut trees. The tradition of extraction with detailed concern for conservation begins according to Vitug's book. So actually, it, uh, you can uh, lag as many as you want at that time, no? Because there was little uh, concern for conservation. But during the American rule, there's another quote here, the wood of the Philippines can supply the furniture of the world for a century to come. So imagine if uh, their, uh, their uh, inexhaustible, yes. Okay, so as you can see here, this is uh, around the 18th uh, 
uh, 1900s uh, from this period from the between the Spanish and the American uh, colonization the the trend was already steep going down so this represents the areas of the Philippine forest until around 1950s or during or before the war it uh, somehow they've imagined that hey how come there's no more forest and then uh, they were experiencing you know some major troubles uh, uh, related to super typhoons floodings etc so they somehow slowed down and rethink the the whole uh, the whole happening okay so so after that uh, well during the uh, no, during the american period Dr. Julie Bersanola and Dr. Dan Nickrent of the Coast Digital Flora of the Philippines, uh, the bulk of floristic richness as we know today, they considered the American period as the golden age of Philippine botany. Why? Because uh, Merrill, he was assigned to document the, the, the plants of the Philippines. They were able to you know, uh, have a very comprehensive uh, knowledge about the, what's, what can be found here in the Philippines. So, uh, it is also Leonard Cos idol, no? Uh, they were able to get a lot of uh, uh, botanical specimens, etc. So from somehow during the Spanish period, around 1,000, and it grew up, no? And then uh, for Philippine biogeography, uh, Dr. Jean Mayer Molina, uh, she said that the island archipelago of the Philippines, one of the most mega diverse countries in the world. So 5% of the world flora can be found here in the Philippines. And uh, right now we have, as of May 2023, the area, uh, the, the number of we're talking about, the number of species we're talking about of the native species, around 10,000 species. And uh, close to 50% of this is endemics. When we say endemics, it can only be found here in the Philippines and nowhere else in the world. So at least in in one perspective, we are a superpower, no? <laughs> at least uh, five percent of the world's flora can be found here in the Philippines. And another from Dr. Hini, uh, the Philippines has been described as a tenfold mega diverse than the Galapagos. No? So uh, that's how it is. But uh, on current on current times, we are still plagued with the with a much deeper problem. One is the extent of agriculture, the conversion of land or forests into uh, arable areas. And then another, which is happening during modern times, is the use of exotic species for reforestation, etc. So the late uh, Dr. Uh, uh, no, see. Uh, uh, Doctor, uh, uh, trees of Southeast Asia. Uh, Doctor uh, James Lefranchi, uh, he calls the ano yung one hectare of mahogany is a biodiversity dead zone. So imagine we're not just planting one hectare of mahogany, we're planting thousands of hectares of mahogany, gemelina, acacia mangium, acacia auriculiformis. Thick, the, the thick wood, tectona grandis, et cetera, et cetera. So many are actually uh, into this, no? but uh, that's the problem. So most of the areas which uh, were already deforest, deforested are being replanted with exotic species. No? So they're just multiplying the problem. For me, it's okay to plant mahogany as long as you would treat it as a harvestable species no it's like uh, when you're a farmer it's up to you what you want to to, to grow or to raise if you want to raise pigs okay after several months you can slaughter it and turn it into meat no but for trees if you're uh growing uh, exo uh exotic species like mahogany after it's a harvestable period you have to cut it no we don't plant it for perpetuity no and then uh during the Okay, so this is the state of the Philippine forest. So there are several sources, and most of the, the infographics they made are actually the same, no? 
So this one is 1900s. So minus all the Spanish rule, it's still okay because it's green. No, although uh, the, the number of forests is already lessened. But this one is uh, uh, this one is more clearer. Go okay? so 1900, and then 1970s you can see more browns, and then 2000. This is quite uh, quite uh, uh, terrible because they considered that the Philippines has only 3% of the old growth forest left. So imagine that this is actually outdated because it's 2000, it's 23 years after. So what more for are the future generation? We cannot have that old growth forest anymore because to have that, uh, you, have to, anyway, you have to retain the natural heritage of an area. You just cannot simply buy it from uh, a department store or a mall. I want to buy an uh, old growth, growth forest and I want to put it back in the Philippines. No? And that's the bad news. And uh, this one is also latest in the Game of Trees uh, from the DNR webpage. Around 52,000 trees are cut daily. No? And uh, the primary forest loss of the Philippines from 2002 to 20 is uh, right now around 3.3%. The question is why? Why did we arrive to this kind of miserable state? Maybe I would connect it to a colonial mentality. Uh, let's uh, start it with our own Philippine ano, national flower. What is our national flower? Sampagita. Sampagita is actually not native to the Philippines. So how come you keep saying that, you know, the Philippines is highly diverse, we are superpower, etc., etc. But our own symbol, which is our national flower, actually came from India. No, There was a move from, you know, uh, uh, concerned uh, botanists and uh, experts to rename the national flower. Uh, to waling waling, but the bill is still pending, no, on the Senate and the Congress. So how come it's no not changed? And if we are going to look at the all around us, the malls, the commercial areas, the resorts, what do we see? We keep on seeing these two species. This one is a uh, Cuban royal palm. If you go to the highlands or in Tagaytay, you will see this one, a Christmas-looking tree, which actually a native to Australia. This one is uh, uh, Araucaria heterophylla. No? So for landscaping, for urban planning, for regional you know, developments, they keep on using exotic species. We have already lost many native species, but they're still using exotic species. And uh, another problem is the growing population of the Philippines. And uh, to be able to clear land for agriculture, you have to cut the forest no? and then turn it into agricultural area. But uh, I think many of us who are right here, you know the Bahay Kubo, which is a, uh, a, a common uh, Filipino folk uh, song. All of the vegetables that are here or mentioned here are actually exotics. No? So what, basically what we eat every day what we eat as a vegetable or fruit are actually exotics. And to be able to produce that much for the 140 million, you have to clear uh, forest, etc. So according to uh, one of the latest uh, uh, a survey about the agricultural land of the Philippines, it's around 40 plus percent of Philippine land is devoted to agriculture. That includes the agroforestry for, for fruit, uh, for fruit trees, vegetables, etc. So, what are the other, I know, uh, as industries, as uh, residences, etc., etc. So easily that uh, the, the Philippine land is already converted into exotic, not by invasive species, but you know, plants with uh, a specific purpose, which is for food. But is this thing uh, exclusive to the Philippines? No. As you can see here, most of the common foods that people eat around the world actually comes from another continent. No? So if you're living here in somewhere in Europe, most of the things you eat actually came from South America. If you're living here in Asia, 
some of the plants you eat actually came from the Middle East. Some are not, some from South America, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so it's a global thing actually. And uh, since we already know what the problems are, in uh, around 2007, the late Leonard Ko, who was considered as the Filipino people's botanist, he's a very passionate uh, botanist and uh, conservationist. Uh, he, he was able to manage and to, to encourage you know, like-minded Filipinos, whether you're an academician, botanist, you're an enthusiast, etc., to bind together because there's uh, this very urgent call to save the Philippine plants. So he was, he was able to organize and to form the Philippine Native Plants Conservation Society, which he led for you know, quite a short while because he was killed in action. Okay, so what Leonard was saying was the importance of native plants, no? But uh, he took the the shorter route to to promote uh, native plants. So how? It's by talk, simply talking to people, heart to heart, and seeing them eye to eye. And then he would describe plants according to the ethnobotanic uses of plants. So if you're able to meet him, you would easily you know, fall for what he's saying. No? And uh, it, I would consider those he met personally to be lucky no? because uh, he was a legend. No? Uh, one of the top DNR official said that you know, he, he was our top secret weapon. He was the one who really pushed for Philippine plant conservation. And because of his action and because of the organization, uh, many people were prompted. Those who were you know, native plants, you know, no big deal, no, 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 nothing new, nothing important. But because of the inspiration he created, there was already symposiums, you know, Kids Day, we were able to publish books and some other groups are also publishing books. We had these three walks, which, are, which is a PNPCSI uh, unique activity and then uh, lectures, and then reforestations, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, here at Ateneo, we also have the Arboretum, Philippine native plants or native trees, and then in Pinto. And then people are also into, who are into arts now are turning into botanical arts, no? They were inspired because of that, you know, uh, movement, okay? And then online lectures, et cetera, et cetera. So there are small to big victories, no? Like this, uh, you know, in organizations. Uh, I'm sure you've seen this, the, the USD Wild, the Ateneo Wild, etc. No? So these are the, no, uh, quite. Uh, they're very popular, and the the, the move is, uh, you know, keeps on rolling. And uh, this is how they want people like Leonard want to, you know, to influence people, no? But uh, it's the short, uh, it's quite the uh, no, slower move because you have to, you know, to bring people together and then talk and then go around and he would, uh, you would let them see uh, nature at hand, no? And then Masungi and in Sibuyan, et cetera. So what are the causes of the loss of Philippine plants? I think habitat destruction is one caused by land conversions, mining, slash and burn, uh, farming, illegal logging, expansion of agricultural lands, etc. And then, of course, overpopulation, poaching, anti-environment policies, enforcement issues, the effects of invasive alien species, okay, and then natural disasters. So, example, uh, this one is currently exhibited at the National Museum. This is open pit mining. The forest above would simply disappear, you know, just to extract what's beneath the ground. So that's how we lose our forest. And then, uh, because of the many losses we have, uh, people like Leonard and other top botanists they were able to come up with the threatened plants of the Philippines, just to keep us uh, that alarming note that hey, out of the ten thousand right now, based on the two thousand seventeen list of the DNR, it's around 900 species of threatened plants of the Philippines, which are uh, uh, categorized from critically endangered up to the 
other threatened species. So that much. So this time we are uh, right for the, uh, no, the, the revision of this. So because every five years, this is being uh, revised. No? So from 900, who knows? It may be 1,000, 1,200, we don't know. And, but despite of all the negative things happening, you'll be surprised that you know, even on small nooks or even on you know, small patches of land or forest, people who are, were inspired by Leonard and all those who are concerned with the native plants movement, they, can, they still keep on discovering new species. One is the newly discovered just this week, is the Helicia Danlagun Sadiai, one of the co-founders of uh, uh, the Philippine Native Plant Conservation. Pinangal Leonardo Coy was, uh, is, is an endemic palm of the Philippines. And just this week, another very small aroid was discovered in Samar by some of our colleagues, by Danit Tandang and uh, Marge. Okay, so hopefully there's more. And uh, now I turn you over to my friend who will go give you the synthesis about the discussion. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so the title of my uh, synthesis for, for, for the talk no, is uh, the McDonaldization of uh, Philippine plant diversity. You know? So I think it's a perfect analogy, yung, ano, no, the, uh, you know, the, the fast food, uh, uh, no, no, fast food uh, colonization of our, ano, yung, 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 the, 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 of our biodiversity, you know, uh, the, like, uh, ay, ano ba This is our, uh, uh, there, there's a misconception uh, regarding our, our, our Philippine flora. No? We, we, there's a mis misconception that uh, our 10,000 species are, are uh, homo homogeneously distributed throughout the archipelago. No? Uh, what makes our biodiversity so distinct is a, uh, is that we are uh, there are about seven thousand islands uh, and uh, these species are, 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 are what do you call this distributed uh, they are highly localized no so some of the, uh, highly endemic no so these are the type of forests that we have no? this is a tropical lowland evergreen forest. So each, uh, each uh, what do you call this, ecological habitat has its own uh, floristic assemblage of species that won't be found in other uh, ecosystems. No? So the tropical lowland evergreen forest would have mostly uh, dipterocarps. These are the tall uh, towering trees which make up the backbone of the Philippine lowland forest no uh, and unfortunately the the pterocarps were one of the among the first uh these are among the most the, the pterocarps are the premium lumber that was extracted from 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 our natural environment the habitats no so this became uh so the what do you call this the, the the pterocarps are the, the backbone of a uh, Philippine lowland forest. No? So uh, these, these are known as keystone species. No? And keystone species are, once they are removed from, from the environment, everything collapses. No? There's this, uh, it, the keystone is like a, in, in uh, what do you call this, uh, architecture. No? It is the, the arch, it, it, it holds everything. Uh, it, uh, once you remove the keystone from the arch, everything collapses. No, so a keystone species once it's removed from from its uh, habitat, uh, the the forest will cease to exist as it is. Uh, no, no, 
as we know them. No? So these are the tropical law and yeah. And this is the mangrove forest. So species that you find in, in a tropical lowland forest are very different from all the species that you find in a mangrove forest. No? The mangrove forest consists mostly of uh, coastal species. No? And this is tropical lower mountain forest. Uh, these are mostly pine trees and uh, mossy forest. And uh, here you go. And this is a beach forest. This is uh, one of the most common uh, because, of course, we have the, the biggest coastline. No? So these are the most common species that you would find in the Philippines. No? So I was talking about the McDonaldization of the Philippine forest. No? It's uh, what do you call it? it it's, uh, it's uh, I think, an analogy to the globalization and the, the what do you, what's, the, what's the word for this? The, 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 the takeover of our natural habitats, no? So this is the, this is the karst, uh, this is what you see in, in El Nido, no? The, the karst uh, limestone forest formation. So, uh, where did I begin? No, uh, there's this, uh, there's this thing that we call plant blindness, which I think is a uh, afflicting, afflicting 20th century. Uh, it's a it's an affliction that's quite recent. No, uh, our ancestors had a connection with with the uh, with the land, which uh, I think we we have lost uh, since the uh, since the advent the advent of the next century. No, so if you look at these these forests. What you see mostly are green, you know. So you think it's a it's a very thick forest, and it is. No, these are, but here we have the mahogany forest. Uh, for those who are uh, suffering from this affliction of plant blindness, uh, yeah, it might all look the same, no. But this is an the highly invasive ipil ipil forest, no. For those of us who, who just see green, you may think that this is a this is a healthy forest, no? But uh, yeah, this is a, a, mahog a mahogany forest, like uh, Anthony mentioned earlier. This is a bio biological dead zone, you know. So Like uh, it's uh, like a monocropping. Most of the species that you see here are, uh, it's, you see, a mo uh, it's like a monocropping. You know, it's not. It does not. Uh, the composition of an it's not uh, what that a natural forest composition would be like. So. So my analogy with the with the, the biodiversity is with the food, you know. Uh, we have the we have the different flavors in uh, each region would have its own distinct uh, flavor, no. So with the invasion of uh, with the invasion of McDonald's or even uh, Jollibee, you know, once uh, it's it's just a sign that once once. Uh, this establishment uh, sets foot on a province. The diversity of flavor, the, the the flavors and the character of the food disappears. No, so it's very the so there's it's very analogous to the global the McDonaldization of the Philippine forest. No, uh, once uh, the invasive species set foot, uh, uh, everything is become becomes homogenized. No, everything that the, the uh, the regional flavor, the regional character, or the the idiosyncrasies of of a uh, of a re, uh, of a province or uh, or a town loses its character by the by the bringing of the globalized uh, system. The, the junk food uh, takes over. 
So let me look at some keywords that I want to discuss. No, the so yeah, we have the ten thousand species of uh, trees. They are not uh, homogeneously distributed. No. Uh, so they are highly localized and endemic. So this uh, the the loss of our the wait. Let me step step back. Uh, Nate. Let me start with with uh, we're talking about uh, no no the invasive the invasive species no so wait uh, can we reformat can we make it a more a more uh interactive discussion uh maybe maybe, maybe i can ask it maybe you can ask questions because i'm more uh, extemporaneous uh, that way no? uh, is there anything we have to cover uh, the in, uh Does that make sense when I say the national uh, McDonaldization of uh, the Philippine biodiversity? Uh, but I think it's kind of self-explanatory, you know. But uh, but I thought it was catchy, you know. But I I sort of made a, a bit uh, uh, at a loss right now. So earlier I was talking about uh, uh, the idea of the invasive species uh, as a, it's a kind of uh, biological vandalism. Uh, so I was uh, earlier uh, talking about uh, our ecosystems as, as repositories of uh, knowledge and as uh, our, like uh, each uh, ecosystem, the, They are analogous to uh, repositories of knowledge, no? uh, libraries that our ancestors could uh, could uh, read, like a book. But uh, at some point in time during the the uh, successive uh, series of uh, colonization, we gradually lost our capacity to read our forests, and therefore our uh, capacity to decipher our for these bodies of knowledge so this is the great tragedy of the uh the, the coming of the invasive the invasive species so each one is a each one is a well i like to use analogies no but i each one is a composition, a painting. Oh, I'm an artist, no? So, uh, or, or, or an, an, an art, uh, maybe an orchestra. It has its own composition, you know? But, but when, when an invasive species enters the picture, I, I refer to it as a biological vandalism, no? So it, 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 uh, our, our, our it ruins our capacity to 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 appreciate music. It's like when somebody is playing a concert, no, a classical music, and somebody plays the electric guitar. Uh, then again, maybe it could be fusion, you know. So <laughs> I, I I don't know, but uh, essentially that's a that's a problem. This is a karstana to, no, major. It's a it's a yeah tropical lowland. Major me karstana rin siya. What's the karst formation? So the karst forest has its own unique uh, attributes. Karst forest is essentially a mountain uh, made out of limestone. No? So the, the plants that evolve here are very specialized. No, They, 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 they evolve to adapt to these uh, very uh, harsh conditions. 
also with the with the high mountain forest no but the, the invasive species one of the traits of the invasive species is that uh, they are very adaptable they are very resilient no so basically they were introduced here because of these properties no? because at some time at one point in time people thought that these are would the the introduction of mahogany or if these were thought as miracle plants no that would save the eco the economy or what but the uh, what do you call that? Uh, they turn out to be into uh, Frankenstein's monsters, huh? So they they took over our forest. So it, this is the uh, this is the mahogany forest, no? Huh? Um, so another form of uh, we we vilify the uh, the mahogany now, no? We see it as a as a we we demonize it and. Uh, Actually, it is. No, it has become very invasive. But uh, it is not evil in itself. No, what uh, what uh, makes it evil is our over over reliance and our lack of knowledge of what other alternatives we have. No, so we see this as a so the the invasiveness invasiveness is not only biological. No. The bio uh, alien in the invasive species, it could also be the invasion of our psyche. So, like I was saying before, no, we were able to we appreciate our our local species because we had a connect connection to it. We knew the names. Um, actually, this is the importance of taxonomy, no, because uh, once you forget the names, you for, you 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 lose that psychic link. Psychic link. With 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 the uh, with with the plant, no. So, are you aware, for instance, of uh, the province of Mabalakat or uh, Apalit uh, or what are your provinces? Uh, Mauban, uh, Manila, even Manila. Did you know that Manila was named after a plant? It was named after Hydrophilaceae sifophora, sifophora. So it was uh, when the when the Spaniards came here, it was full of man, man, nilad. It was called locally known as nilad. So it was manilad. It was uh, teeming with nilad trees at one time. No, of course, it has been locally extirpated since. So now the name doesn't bear any significance anymore. No, but what I'm saying was. Now we don't even know the origin, the etymology of our 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 now uh, uh, capital, the capital of Manila. We don't. So th th these are just a series of random syllables. Manila it doesn't mean anything. So part of the the part of the what do you call this? The invasion is it's part of the the invasion of our psyche. Also, we we have lost our our psychic link with with with, with the land. So earlier I was talking about Mauban on all these names of most most of our provinces or uh, cities were named after the prominent features of the land, no? Like they were named after trees, mostly trees, or maybe I don't know. Uh, like the Nalupian is like a centipede because it's it's a curving road, uh, but mostly trees. Like I said, Apalit, uh, Mabalakat, Dao. Uh, Probably you don't even know. Maybe if it's a weird name, you never figured out. It's probably named after a tree, or uh, like uh, ano pa ba? Uh, can you? There's so many hundreds, and there are hundred uh, also. Like talisay, talisay is a coastal species. It's a, actually a tree, but there are many cities around Mani uh, the Philippines archipelago that is named talisay. So there's a clue. It, it, it's it's widespread, no. So there's a talisa in Batangas, a talisa in so many other places. But it, it's indicative of uh, the lay of the land. So yeah, what I was trying to say is that uh, we have this con yeah, we have lost also this psychic link with with with, with the land, the lay of the land. No, so uh, we we. 
this is part of the invasion, the invasion of our psyche. The invasion, it, it displaced our, our capacity to, to have this connection with, with our land. No? So knowing these names, it's, it's, it's taxonomy, I think, is uh, the first, uh, the baby steps in, in uh, uh, botany. No? I think it's the, it's a, sabi nila, no, no, it's the, it's the, what, what do you call it? It's it's not the uh, the world's oldest profession is not what you think it is. It is actually taxonomy, because uh, the first thing God did, uh, what asked commanded Adam to do is name all the species, no, all the the first. So it's uh, it's the basic, it's the essential first step to reconnect. I was saying the it was these are repositories of knowledge. The 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 I think it's it begins with. Knowing the names. Oh. And I don't mean the, the local names. So I think now we have to go to, because I know there are a lot of groups now uh, into uh, native species, no? Uh, but I think what they're lacking is, uh, we have to go by the scientific names. It is essential that we learn the scientific names because this is the only constant names that uh, we can rely on, no? So... It's the ABCs, you know, we have to first go with, uh, it's the first order of the day, naming names, attaching names to, so, so if we are going to get into this business of uh, uh, re re restoring our forests and our habitats, our natural habitats, uh, yeah, we have to go by the names. So, which is essentially what the PNPCSI is setting out to do, you no? Know? And also, we have to have, as an artist, or we have to tell stories, or we have to have a, a yeah, I keep talking about this psychic link between, between nature. I'm, just, I'm not just talking about plants. No, it, it, it all connects. It all, it's, it, it's all connected. So plants, the habitat, the, the environment, and us. Hmm. Actually, when we talk about... Uh, the definition of uh, no, no, the natives, so let, let me talk about natives to make it clear, no? or to make it very succinct. No, no. The, the native species, any, uh, the, the shortest definition of what is a native species is anything that was not introduced deliberately, whether deliberately or accidentally by humans. So, if you're wondering when people say is this native or is this uh, introduced, you know, if there's a human human uh, intervention in the in its uh, dispersal, no. So actually, human humans are the number one invasive species, you know? <laughs> But then again, we're also part of nature. Then again, we are. We are the wild cards of nature, no? So we we bypass all these natural barriers and all these uh, other hindrances, no? So such that uh, man is not just a, a, a he's not just a part of the landscape, no? He is the shaper of the landscape. So essentially, it's the species that he brings along with him that turns out. Uh, we don't have the foresight no, to tell, well, before. Now we, we know a, a bit better, but we don't have the foresight to tell which species are going to be invasive and which are, are most of the species that were introduced deliberately in the country. They were supposed to be the miracle, the wonder cures for everything. You know? when, they, when they brought the, 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 the kohol, the golden kohol, everyone thought it was the new... Uh, it will feed the hungry, you know. When when they brought the mahogany trees, they thought it would uh, supply uh, uh, because the dip, a dipterocarp would take about fifty years to harvest, no? Whereas a, a mahogany would take 10, 10 years. You could harvest it, no? But then again, at, so everyone thought it was the it was the cure, a miracle tree that would save us, no? But uh, as we know, the saying, you know, the, the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. No? We didn't know any better then. 
there was no there was no science behind it so that's a, that's the caution you know, the, the, uh, anything we do without the backing of science uh, is uh, bound to, le uh, to to lead to uh, detrimental results you know so without you know, so we mahirap yung ano if it's just going by uh, enthusiasm or what no without without the backing of, of uh, statistics so so that's uh what what else with the so essentially that that is uh that's a problem you're familiar with the see, see there was this guy in, in very famous quote it's chief seattle i think you they named Seattle after the, the after the chief, chief Seattle. No? You know, he, he was uh, when when the when the American government was buying buying the land from them. No, he was saying, "How do you buy the land? How do you uh, uh, how does one own the land?" So, uh, man does not the earth does not belong to man. Man man belongs to earth. No, everything is connected. So, and that man did not weave the web of life. He is a strand in that web. And what he does to the web, he does to himself. No, so he ended it with the quote: uh, it, "It it is, uh, what did he say? It it is the end of living and the beginning of survival." So that's the, that's uh, essentially you know, the, the the issue with the the invasive species. No, uh, it's a uh, when we when it takes over, it displaces all these uh, other species that we had the connection with. Them. So it's a it's a kind of uh, self impoverishment, uh, and because we 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 don't know we don't we don't uh, we don't seek to know. Or uh, earlier, uh, Anthony was talking about the. Uh, in the, the discovery of new species, the, all, all these species that are being discovered, even as we only have 3% of our primary forest, no? only 3% of our primary forest left. Uh, it's actually double-edged. Uh, probably the reason why we're, 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 disco we're discovering the new species is because uh, uh, we're giving up our last secrets, no? Yeah. Sabi nga nung ano, actually, I missed that point. Sabi ni Chief Seattle, uh, once the scent of man, uh, once every, once every secret corner of the forest is uh, filled with the scent of man, and we're talking about the talking wires, no? Blotting the landscape. At the time, the, 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 ano yung telegram pa lang yata, you know? So, yeah, that's the end of, uh, that's the end of living. And the beginning of uh, survival. So essentially, the the the, the native invasive species, we would go probably most of us would go on living, but it's the quality of life that we're losing. You know, the flavor and and uh, all these nuances. Once all these uh, diversity is gone, you no, know, we we can we we can. We will probably survive. We don't really know what is the minimum or the minimum number of species that we can lose uh, to keep on to keep surviving. You no, know? but uh, why wait for that? Why, why wait wait for that point? You know, and uh, certainly, uh, we it's a it's a kind of self impoverishment. Uh, we deprive ourselves of all these tiny. Miracles, you know, all this, this, this schismatoglottis that was discovered last week. It's, uh, this evolved into, it, it's not, it's not arbitrary. This thing did not just uh, appear there, no. These are forces of nature uh, took place to come up with this tiny miracles, you know, and then and, and these miracles would disappear as soon as, uh, Sabing are feeling it. They're giving up our last secrets, no, because they're about to become extinct. The reason why we're discovering it is because we opened up a new road in this inaccessible place, 
and and I was telling you the high endemism of our our flora. Uh, probably a lot of species would be uh, found along that road. No, uh, to give an example, we're going to some of us are going to the PNPC is going to Atimonan. I can invite some of you who might be interested. No, I'm going to show them the what Leonard Co showed us. 10 years, more than 10 years, years to Leonard, maybe more a dozen years ago. We went there to look at the Silaginella at Imonensis, no? So we were all excited. The Silaginella at Imonensis has not been seen since uh, 1950s or what. So we were so excited no, to go there. No? So finally, we went to Atimon and there it was. Here it is. Silaginella at Imonensis. The plant was this small. No? It was really uh, my, almost microscopic. But that, that, that entire population of ferns is only known on this, on one wall of Pinag uh, Banderahan, maybe this big. The, the, the entire population, it's endemic to that wall. That's how localized it is. It's endemic to this patch of wall. Now, if that wall collapses, nobody knows if there's another existing population. Uh, no. So that's, 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 how, how, that's how precarious our biodiversity is. You know? and, but that's each, each, each of these plants has its story to tell, evolved into, it has its own secret, its own, own lessons. So, it evolved there for specific uh, reasons. No? Uh, so it just didn't appear there. No? So these are tiny little miracles. No? So, I mean, it, would be, it would be such a shame to, to, to lose all these miracles before we even know they are there. So. I could ramble on. And about the invasive species. Well, I was connecting it to, to the, the, the show. No? Uh, it's a, the, 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 we lose our, our we lose our identity by, by the coming of the uh, the, the homogenization. It's not, I don't know if it's really bad, no? homogenization of uh, the McDonaldization of, of, our, of our biodiversity. No? So yung, the Ilongo cooking is gone. The, when, when McDonald's comes into the fray, wala ng Ilongo cooking, wala, it will slowly die. All these flavors and nuances will slowly die. Uh, sa Kapampangan, Ilok Ilocano, all these Flavors will, you will just have a quarter pounder with cheese, you know, and set up naman for minsan minsan, or maybe I, I get a Sunday from time to time. But yeah, it's so, so, so sad to lose all these things that we, and the, and the saddest thing is we don't even know that what, what, what we are losing, you know, so. I guess this was what, uh, what, what, uh, Mula, Mula, what's his name? The, the, <laughs> this was talking about the, the, the loss of memory. Yeah, 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 this is, it's a collective memory that we're losing. Now, that PNPCSI is trying to retrace these steps. No, uh, we're losing this collective memory, collective, uh, racial, uh, may pagkayong ako eh. I, I like all these archetypes and, uh, I don't know. We, we, all these archetypes, they're, they're losing all their all the symbolisms. Uh, I look at them as uh, no, I, I see I also see it from an artist's point of view. All these symbolisms are, are, are all these uh, archetypal lessons are lost on us eh, with, 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 the, with the, the, the with the invasion of uh, alien species. So essentially. <laughs> <laughs> That's how was. you might have questions or maybe some things I have not we have not really covered. Yes, 
Anthony can join us also. Test one two. All right, it's okay. Um, so if uh, we would like to thank Chris, Sir Anthony, and Sir Ronald for your lectures. Yeah. Uh, yes, Paul. So, um, since we are also past the lecture, ano na no? Um, so if we'll open the floor for questions for Sir Anthony and Sir Ronald. So, any? So if... Hi, I'm Stephanie. Um. I think it's very interesting that your talk is in a museum because the arts and sciences were at some point intrinsically connected. It was only latter that they were separated, but as you made it very clear, the natural scientists were drawing the plants. So they were artists and then later on, they invented photography in the 1800s to make it even more accurate. Um, I was curious about what your, your interest in connecting the arts and sciences, what you're doing in that the Arboretum specifically, because Pinto is also a museum. And earlier, before the talk started, you were talking about the notion of, of beauty, which is a term artists always think about. Uh, yes. Uh, wait, what, what, do I what maybe, was the first maybe, question again? Maybe let's begin with what your project in the Arboretum. What, what are you doing there? Uh, uh, if you have time to see the Pinto Arboretum, actually I haven't been there for a while, no? but uh, it's essentially, uh, well, as an artist, I, I found the, and then as an artist meeting Leonard Ko, I saw the urgency, the, the environment, uh, especially at the time there were so many artists cropping up, so many good ones and some okay ones, not, uh, I thought uh, we didn't need that many artists, no. And I thought that uh, probably we had to address the issue. The env environmental concerns were more were more what well, urgent and it needed to be addressed more urgently. So my first exhibit was entitled "On the Origin of Species," in that was in 1987. So I was already uh, I had the. the uh, and always, as a, as a writer, I use the natural sciences as, as as I resort to a lot of analogies. So a lot, I see a lot of natural processes. I use them as a uh, anal uh, analogy, analogous process to, to to analogous to the art processes, the uh, like the layering, the stratification uh, of. Uh, in geological process, I, in painting, I, I I relate my painting to the ge geological processes on layering and uh, and all that, and also uh, the artist intrinsically. I, I was always talking to Leonard about about the relationship of the artist and 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 the sci the sciences. No, uh, uh, the word ecology itself was coined by an artist. So an artist, uh, an artist, uh, naturalist. See Ernst Ernst Haeckel. Siempre ayon ko kung financial na yata siya for being German, ano? <laughs> but uh, for being uh, a master race, ano? No? Pero well, the ima evolution. They had these evolutionary notions, de ba na of being ano? But yeah, he came, he came up with the word uh, ecology and ontology. So I think young artists intrinsically is connected to, to, to the sciences. Um, uh, when we came up with the show, The Phylogeny of Desire, it, it was about uh, it was the, about the artist's eye and the taxonomist's eye. A reason, one of the reasons why the, the why the, the, the affinity between the artist and the taxonomist is, is, the, is the, this, this, the discerning eye. I think that that allows the, the that allows the taxonomist to, to um, determine one species from the other. No, so yeah, it, it's it's no accident that a lot of uh, taxonomists are, are, have an artistic slant or vice versa. Um, 
Ako, I, I, I don't have the patience for, for, for the categorizing of things. I'd, I'd rather break the, 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 the categories. No? But I, 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 I admire the, the, the artistic tenacity or the, ano, no? the tenacity of the, the scientist or, or, or the artist in, in sticking to these uh, little details, uh, significant details. Ano ka madagdag? Okay. I could ask him. So the title is Philippine Flora Before and After the Galleon Trade. Um, after the gal, uh, I noticed that a lot of the plants, the words are not like um the one for peanut um money. They're they're not actually from Spain that colonized us, but. They were coming from the words are coming from Cebu. I mean, sorry, are coming from Peru, the Aztecs. Is that mainly the main influence of after the galleon trade? That's why the names. I mean, because there is a focus on the taxonomy and the names. That's why many of the names are not Spanish as we know it from Europe, but actually from South America. Well, I think that uh, most of the plants, uh, the names of the plants were Filipinized somehow. And uh, because back then there was still no, the the science of taxonomy wasn't, you know, uh, as available as what we have right now. So for people, it's basically, they, they just, uh, they were just more entertained with the value and the use so they call it uh, according to their local language, etc. Another, uh, I was talking about the, the colonization of our psyche, you know, uh, you, the the invasion. It's not just the invasion of the speed uh, of, of the the physical uh, invasion in itself, but it's also an invasion of the psyche. Like these, these are subtle nuances. No, when you, when you talk about uh, there are we. My favorite example is we have two, two critically endangered species. No, the Tristaniopsis the Cortita, and the, uh, ano tong, uh, the, no Tristaniopsis the Cor the Cortita and uh, ano tong Philippine tick? Tectona Filipinensis. No, so these are two critically endangered endemic species found only in the Philippines. And yet, what do we name these plants? We name them, they're both named Malabayabas. So Malabayabas, critically endangered Malabayabas 1 and critically endangered Malabayabas 2. And what is the Bayabas? Bayabas is, ano bang scientific name ng Glacier? Sidium, Sidium well, Guajaba? Oh. It's a, it, we are, Describing two critically endangered species, Philippine species, two critically, critically endemic endangered species, naming it after a, a bayabas, which is introduced from the south from South America. So it's our psyche. We are naming a plant after the, the, the attributes of an exotic species, of a non-native species. We're using a non-native uh, metaphor to describe an, 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 an endemic. A rare species, so that's what I mean by our self-impoverishment. No, so malabayabas. It's so common. You see it in every garden. The bayabas. You see it in. But why would you describe this very rare plant as like? Uh, the, the literal translation of malabayabas is like a bayabas. So this tree, this is like a bayabas, and this is like a bayabas. That's how generic the names are. So. It's a kind of impoverishment. Uh, another example is uh, ano ba to? Okay, it escapes me right now. But th there are a lot of situations that uh, uh, the, ano, the another example, perfect example. I was talking about dipterocarps. The Philippines has about fifty plus species of dipterocarps. No, dami uh, mahogany. <laughs> No, <laughs> I've been colonized. I've been colonized. So, no, 50 species. Yakal, Apitong, Almon, uh, Lawan, 50 of them. But 
then the Americans came and uh, used them all up. No, most most of the, I think in a lot of uh, colleges in, in the the Ivy League, you would have uh, huge tables from Philippines. Made they they call this Philippine mahogany. Fifty species of diptar diptarocarps, all lumped as Philippine mahogany, and we we as Filipinos we 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 learn to refer to them to the diptarocarps as Philippine mahogany. All 50, all 50, 50 key, keystone species lumped as Philippine mahogany, lumped as the invasive Philippine mahogany. So I, I refuse to call them Philippine mahogany. I want to call the mahogany the false dipterocarp because it's the one, uh, it's the one that took over the identity of 50 keystone species in the Philippines that are now all critically endangered because they were, they were displaced. The, the mahogany in itself is not evil. In fact, it is critically endangered. In, 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 the irony of it all is it's critically endangered in its natural habitat. So, but here it has become, it has colonized our physically, our land and our psyche. So, that's how deep the, the invasion is. No, it's not just a, it's not just a physical invasion, but a psychic invasion also. Thank you. Maybe somebody else. Any more? Bakaw, maybe we need to clarify some some terms. Might not have been too. Uh, maybe we were rushing. Uh, out. Um, we have a we have a series of questions from Facebook Live. Um, since we're online, also um, from Miss Marie Balange, um, are there laws that protect biodiversity in the hands of indigenous people? Laws that protect biodiversity, yes, in the hands of. Uh, Essentially, they are protected, no? From ano, they they are allowed to to harvest uh, the critically endangered species. But uh, I have reservations about this, no? Na sometimes, take a cancel ako, eh. <laughs> might, no, but. Uh, the idea of the indigenous people sometimes is a bit the the the, the distinction uh, to me is a bit uh, blurred. No, but, uh, I think they have been an an gentrif. What's the word for that? Gen not, they've been hybrid. <laughs> or, ano ba yun? Uh, they they assumed a lot of. Uh, uh, Mike Book, Louisa. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, they've assumed a lot of values that the lowlanders uh, espouse. No, so, medyo ano ne, na, like they can, they're allowed to har to get deer or wild boar or uh, I don't know, or the the critically endangered butaan or the ano to, the 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 bitatawa, no? They, you see them on Facebook. They're cooking it na, ano nila, because they're allowed to do that. Pero yun, the, the values, I don't know if it's still there. The, ano, yeah. you, you, you know, the, 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 it's been adulterated already. Eh, the, 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 their values. So, medyo may, may reservations ako about this. I don't know, Anthony, what do you think? All Philippine wildlife is covered by the Wildlife Act. Our Republic Act 9147. So yung issues about yung mga IPs having, you know, special privileges is, you know, quite subjective also. There's also an IP law for that. Pero siguro, uh, let's be realistic also that uh, uh, because of, you know, the, the, the dangers coming and the, the, the new situation, I mean, everyone, whether you're an IP or a, a lowlander, we, we should also adjust accordingly no so if it's already critically endangered and you know you can still hold on you might as well uh, eat another species which is domesticated or you know 
no chicken, di ba? <laughs> or, you know, uh, you also do your part in conservation. Because in, like, uh, what... what uh, yes, oh. Uh, like uh, how I started it earlier, parang the IPs, they regarded the forest as, ano, a sacred. So, sana ganun pa rin siya, na parang sana. In some areas, ganun yung practice. Pero in other areas, you know, just like uh, what uh, uh, Ronald said, sometimes that privilege is, you know, uh, somehow abused din siya. Na parang you can do just slash and burn. How many, you know, how many hectares? Pero alam naman natin na, ano, na parang uh, it's better to save yung forest na lang rather than you can always look for ano a uh, space which you can do agriculture pero wag na wag naman yung ano yung mga natural forest pa also siguro yung ano yung uh, okay. see um another question from the same um participant or viewer is are there studies done on carbon capture for our native tree species if so, are they available to the public? Yung, uh, yung for yung mga carbon capturing, uh, the new the in thing right now or yung the newest uh, parang trend right now is yung blue carbon, which is yung for mga mangrove species. So they have uh, studied that you know mangroves has parang better capacity to ano to grab yung carbon compared to terrestrial species. So ngayon yung parang game is parang doon yung more on yung mga carbon offsetting etc yun yung doon yung focus nila ngayon. So I think mar maraming ano there's a lot of studies uh done being done all over the Philippines. Because of ano no kaya nga actually hindi ba kaya kaya rin uh, the reason why the, the mangrove species were depleted early on because because of the panaderias no it's the best uh firewood around no because of its high heat because it sequesters a lot of carbon. So when you, when you use it, that's why it became endangered early on because all these uh, roots were being harvested by our bakeries to make bread. No? So premium. Kaya masarap yung, ano, yung pandesal natin dati. It's because we used to uh, put bakawang, the mangrove, to, to ang ganda, high heat and ano, sus, high sustained heat. So maganda siya mag, ano, mag sequester talaga ng carbon. No? But... Pero yung ano ko rin, uh, I think uh, we should move. If it's just sequestering carbon, medyo, ano, we, we, we're not looking at, we're not prioritizing the diversity. Uh, or we're missing out on that. Ano, no? uh, a lot of these carbon sequestration initiatives are focusing on just a few, uh, some of them exotic species. Pa, eh, diba? na, ano, th so there's no re real... Uh, uh, concern for for biodiversity. I think there should be an initiative na, because it's 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 a kind of a trendy thing right now. Tung tung carbon sequestration and hindi ko pa, It's a it's a first world ano yan eh. uh, First world ano ba yan? Uh, ek, ek. <laughs> But so uh, maybe they should. Yeah, you get paid for it, no? So that's that that's a positive. Uh, I mean that the third world country, the, the the host gets paid for for the sins of the 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 the, the one who I don't know who pays you for it. But maybe they should focus on on, on biodiversity or sequestration carbon cum biodiversity also because they're missing out and and uh, the environment is missing out on that uh, that package. You know? Um, so we have another question. This one is from the Zoom participants naman. So from Mr. Paolo Ben Pakulan. Um, I believe he teaches here in Ateneo. Yes. So um, his message is, Salamat po sa impormasyon at inspirasyon. Bala ko pong ikwento ang mga sinabi ninyo sa mga estudyante ko. Ang tanong ko po ay, ano ang ideal nating sitwasyon tungkol sa katutubong halaman natin sa hinaharap? At ano po ang dapat gawin para maabot ang ideal na ito? Salamat. Uh, for practical reasons, he mentioned that he's teaching here in Ateneo. So, yung I know one of the best way is uh, have that that you know easy connection is to have a nature walk or a tree walk, just like what uh, Leonard started years ago. 
So ngayon parang duplicated na siya nung uh, mga admins nung Ateneo Wild. So every month they have this uh, thing called uh, uh, nature walk here in Ateneo for the Ateneo community. So it's uh, maybe two to, two to three hours na walk. So they are exposed with yung mga trees and then yung mga other agents, katulad ng limbawa mga, mga birds and everything which comes in between yung mga variables na tinatawag. So parang mas doon yung nakaka-captivate yung yung ano eh yung hearts and mind ng mga people so rather than yung mga mga ano mga texts and publications parang minsan parang so, so it's so sophisticated na parang I don't have time to read pero pag yung kwento mo yung mga kwento about yung ethnobotany and yung relationship ng mga between interspecific na mga species yun yung mas ano interesting and that's what keeps you going on And then parang kami palaging ano it's although it's the slower uh, way of converting people pero isipin mo lang if that person halimbawa is is a bird hunter so pag na-convert mo siya into birding or ano parang minus one ka palagi so hopefully mas ano mas maraming gumawa ng ganung activity yung birding parang ano yun eh no the, the birders with all their cameras and ano Parang it's a sublimated uh, urge for hunting. Eh. Yung, ano, it's like shooting. You're literally shooting the bird you know, with the camera. Eh. So parang I think you can, you, you can sublimate these urges eh, into more... So like minsan, uh, I, 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 I think we should... Like the loggers, yung loggers from the 70s. or I don't, They have so much knowledge, so, so much innate or first-hand knowledge. about our species. Siyempre, sila yung mga, minsan sa amin, kami umubos ng mga puno dito sa bundok na to. Eh. Uh, eh, minsan, gusto mong uh, sakalin. No? But, but they, they, they actually have so many first-hand knowledge that you can learn from. So, or even yun, yung mga hunters, no? Like, uh, when we were in Cebu yan, si Mayor, Mayor Tindo, na, the, the mayor, was telling us, uh, all, uh, he, he, every kind of bird in this uh, island I've shot. I'm proudly, you know, claiming I've, I've killed every kind of, every species of bird in this. Uh, oy, nasabi ka ba online? <laughs> Sana hindi nanonood. But, but yeah. So, but he knew. He was telling us all these, uh, uh, all these, he knew all the habits of the birds and even the fishes. No, no, no. And uh, they have so much. Meron pa nga siyang kwento that still puzzles me up to now eh, that, uh, And then he, went, he saw this fish that was swimming this way, attacked him. It was swimming this way. And sabi nga niya, he never saw that. It, that was the only time. So it was in Cantingas River. It was only the only time that he saw this black fish uh, attack him. Uh, up to now, it, it fascinates. Ano kaya yun? Sabi ko na ano. They have so much first-hand knowledge that uh, we should... There's also this uh, logger in, logger in, I interviewed in Zambales. Sabi niya, sila yung umubos nung ano. He was the one I was thinking of. Sabi, Ako kami umubos ng puno dyan sa bundo. But he was telling me that uh, there was a time when he, they logged this area and then it rained. It was a dry, dry, dry mountain. And it rained and there were pools of, uh, there were puddles. Temporary, temporal pools in the mountain. No? And after a few days, he saw fish there. Uh, para emerge. No? So, these are, uh, Um, natural wonders, diba? a phenomenon. Na, ano, na, the, may, they, they have this uh, knowledge that baka, baka ano na. Ha? <laughs> baka ano? <laughs> baka. <laughs> baka. <laughs> Basta, yeah, there, there's so many things that we can learn from. I don't know. But if we can, we can sublimate the, 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 our, our and I don't repurpose. repurpose their 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 ano no they didn't yung kanilang ano skills <laughs> okay may other questions pa po ba from the audiences students ayan okay, let me check the Q&A Hindi, parang may isang part ng person. Isa pa. 
the, the last one. Uh -oh. How do you share the? No, how do you share? Uh, what, what we're doing? We were doing. We're, we're doing the three walks. No, the series of three walks in in. Well, we have one in UP, and also meron dito. No, this is particular group conducting the three walks. And then it, it's very. It's very. Ano ba yun? Tactile. Oh, ano? It's it's a uh, an active uh, as opposed to reading books. Uh, ito nga uh, uh, advertised na lang namin yung ano nanda. Yung we have this activity in P and PCSI called the uh, ano yun, a classroom without walls. So that was what uh, Leonard was always telling us. The you cannot learn botany in the classroom. You cannot learn about nature in the classroom. You have to uh, you have to be out there. Be, be in the actual ano, no, environment, habitat, uh, to, to, to learn about the, you, the nuances. And dami, and dami nuances. And there's so many things you will learn uh, just by being there no, that you cannot teach in the, in the classroom. Uh, yung, the, parang yung the tree walks we're doing in the city. Ito yung mga urban tree walks. Eh. So these are very ano, uh, parang... Primary, primary activities, but it's very, I don't know, it's very effective in immersing, immersing the the, the individual. The, yun yan, yung actual tree hugging and uh, parang next step na yun. But we want to go a bit further by going to the actual uh, sites, the, the natural habitat. Uh, there's nothing like seeing the plants in their natural habitat and someone who with experience or knowledge sharing these uh, uh, anecdotes with you. No? So uh, there's nothing like, you, you, I was saying about taxonomy, the names, and the, knowing something firsthand. And, uh, and like, I don't know your name yet, no? but maybe, uh, Joseph, oh, now that I know you're Joseph, there is a, parang it's a uh, human, uh, it's a wiring. It's a while uh, that oh, si Joseph pala, ito na, ano, ano. a while ago you were just this uh, person who was helping out so medyo, ano, uh, anonymous but once you know the names the a taxonomy once you, you create a psychic link a, a connection with that person no close to tayo ah. no, so you create this uh, <laughs> but that's what i'm saying right? so i think it's very essential that we know the names and know it by heart no because yeah that is what i was wanted in uh, you have to know these things, but uh, sabi nga, uh, cliche na, 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 that, that, that you cannot love the thing, uh, you cannot save the thing that you do not love, no? and you cannot love the thing that you do not know. So, Joseph. Uh. <laughs> so, it starts from the week. Okay, well, noted. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, the, I, I noticed, uh, especially si Anthony kanina, the way you use the scientific names, parang normal na sa'yo, sa amin kasi parang, pero okay lang naman yung local Philippine names, di ba? Or... But you cannot rely on it. Ah, okay. Or they will argue about Malapayapa. Different. So, yung binomial, that's the... Ang haba kasi. Oh, pero, yeah, it, but you can it's, also treat it as a game or, yeah. you know, uh -huh. like uh, usually, uh, and it helps, you know, a bit of Latin or to have a fondness for language, you know, mm. katulad na, ano, uh, dipterocarpus indicus, ano, ano ba, ah, pterocarpus indicus, uh, in corny joke is indicus alamus eh, no? <laughs> Tero, oy, <na> to. <laughs> Tero carpus indicus so tero is wing carpus is fruit so it's wing, wing fruit indicus is from tero carp wing fruit from india so tapos in diptero carpus naman it's two wing diptero carpus two wing fruit so kasi in diptero carp it's, it's this it's this uh uh -oh. Tawag ng Samara, no? it's a seed with two wings. Na, no, no. So, yung pterocarpus, it has a wing, single wing like that. So, they use it for, ano, no? for dispersing yes. themselves. They fly from, to, to fly, literally. No? So, it, 
Tapos kasi namang Filipinenses or Luzonenses or pag may Enses sa dulo, you know, it's a place. Parang Luz- so, ano ba mga, minsan may mga obscure na places pero may Enses sa dulo. Ah, ano pala ito, no? Paragawensis. Minsan yung akala namin yung Paragawensis Paraguay. is from Paraguay. Yung pala sa, sa Palawan pala may Parag, Paraguay. Ano, ano. So, pero you can treat it as a game. It's uh, interesting yun. Uh, ano. yeah, tapos pag sinabing pulkra, it's beautiful. Or uh, odorata, maamoy. Pwedeng maamoy na mabaw. mabaw, mabaw. So, yeah. Yeah, easy. Oh, odorata ba to? So, so ah, malamang may amoy to. Or, ano. So, it's it's a... Uh, It's interesting in itself the the the, the naming of, uh, of of plants. So, you interesting. Thank you, thank you. So, may tanong pa ba? May comments? Stephanie, na kapag tanong ka na kami. Uh. Also, <laughs> I'm sorry. So, um, siguro we'll um we'll end the this session. Thank you very much, Ronald and Anthony. Thank you. Sorry, I missed that. No, pero yeah, I will. I'll watch the recorded. <laughs> Um, I also want edit to... lang natin nung pisa medyo na ano ako na disorient. Ah, sige. Um, we also want to acknowledge uh, that this project, the exhibition project, was actually um, made possible with the support from the Embassy of Spain um, in Manila. And uh, we worked with two ambassadors, um, Ambassador Moragas uh, and the current ambassador, Ambassador um, uh, Utray, Miguel Utray. And Uh, we also collaborated with the Contemporary Art Center in Sevilla, CAAC. So the same exhibition of the Montadas exhibit upstairs was uh, mounted um, because there were more than there were three sets of the objects. So they were able to mount that uh, early last year. No? Um, and um, I, I believe they had a very good, um, parang viewer visitor count uh, visitorship dun sa ano na yon so thank you again for for giving us this very interesting perspective behind the concept of malasierbas i think parang the the concept of malasierbas expanded no um to to other um plants or species or even other aspects of uh, our Uh, environmental um, concerns. No? So thank you also for joining um, for the attendees here on site uh, in the room and in the Zoom room and via Facebook Live. So thank you and good day.